Uh, good morning and welcome to the Gospel of John Bible class. Here we are. Look, we're going into chapter 12. What's just happened? Well, Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. And this guy, who was formerly dead for four days, came out of the tomb at his command. Lazarus come out and everyone that was gathered around to watch went, Wow! They watched Jesus do this. And so, uh, this is it. He's raised someone from the dead. This is time. He's going to, the very next thing in chapter 12 is it's time to go to Jerusalem. We're headed up. And I, I'll, I'll remind everyone of that cosmic uh, reality. You remember, of course, back in the garden with the tree of life at the top of the mountain in the Garden of Eden. And then very close to it, of course, the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. But there are other trees we hear after Adam started to fall and was headed down, uh, falling down. There was, of course, the fig tree the, that he used to cover himself uh, before he was kicked out of the garden. Look, let's make him hide in a bush here with some fig trees. There he is, uh, hiding, peeping out. Is Jesus, is God coming? Yeah, he's going to come. Don't worry. But he's going to do something. And this is going to be important today. And the reason I brought this up is because we are in Bethany. This, this event takes place in Bethany. Bethany means house of figs. And so it's just two miles. This is just two miles off from Jerusalem. Because really, as you can see here, um, God set up his promised land, just like the Garden of Eden, where Jerusalem, the place where the temple is, the top, you go up. You always go up to Jerusalem, and Bethany is just two miles away. So you've got this uh, recreated geographically. He has raised Lazarus and removed the fig covering. They, the last thing he said was, take off those grave clothes and let him go because we're I'm gonna take I'm going up I'm going up it's time for Jesus to go to Jerusalem to die and rise for you and I and so here we go um, keep this in your mind let's pray and we'll look at the text Lord Jesus Christ you're restoring all things all things in all creation and you're doing it in your own body we ask you help us to follow you take us with you and show us exactly who you are and what you're doing for our good. Reveal and hide those things that need it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here we go. Here's the approach. Now, let's ask the questions that are needed. Six days. What did, what did God do in six days? What does this signal to the reader? That's right, creation. Six days he created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Now look at this though. So John's telling us six days, pay attention, Hebrew listener. We're in creation mode, but it's more than that. Look, six days before the Passover. What was the, by the way, this is the book of Genesis. And this is the book of Exodus, the Passover. This was when God uh, delivered his people out of, uh, out of the slavery in Egypt. You recall, yes, that's a lamb. That's the Passover lamb. <laughs> that uh, when they put the blood on the doorpost, um, then the, the, the angel passed over. And that was he, how he delivered them, his people, out of Egypt. Now look what he's doing. Why is John connecting creation and Passover? This Passover was only for God's people. He delivered them from sin and death and slavery. But now look, he's connecting them because he's not just doing it for his people. He's doing it for all of creation. The God of creation has come to carry out his Passover for all of creation, rescuing it from sin and death, and he's about to do it. So pay attention, John says. Now, it's very interesting because you, you know this is true. He's, by the way, in John 1, that's how he starts his whole gospel. He starts with, in the beginning, 
was the word. And he's on and on and on and on about creation in that first chapter. And then even in the same chapter, he's already telling you, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This idea of the Passover and the creation being connected was already the beginning, the whole point of why John is writing. And now he says, look, we're at that point. Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany. We talked about that. Remember the Bethany? Figs. Why Bethany? Because this is about hidden and revealing. We are going to see that all through this story that we uh, look at today. That God is going to be about hiding and revealing certain things. Just like the figs. They hid some, they hid the nakedness. And they revealed some, the hiding, the sin. Jesus is now coming and he's going to hide and reveal certain things. The figs off. He's revealing himself. That's who he's revealing. He's saying, look, I'm here. I am the Lamb of God. And I'm headed for the high place. Now, this is neat. He came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom he, Jesus had raised from the dead. What's the significance of Jesus starting all of this, starting this creation, Passover reality with Lazarus at Bethany? Well, you, you heard it right here. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. He's already shown he can do this. He did it with a, a friend on the individual level, just one person. But now he's going to do it for all creation. That's the significance. Look, down here with one person, up to the tree, the cross. He's going to do it. Let's watch. So they gave him a dinner there. See that? By the way, this is his last Sabbath dinner. Not his last supper, that's on Thursday. But his last Sabbath dinner. So it's significant. Martha served. And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Oh boy, lots in here. So now Martha and Mary. Here we go, we got them. There's Martha and there's Mary. Um, I'm also going to circle Lazarus here for us because these three, this is one family and we need to kind of understand them. Um, as a family. And notice the order. This, they're all connected. And you might even recall how Martha and um, Mary have been contrasted in John's Gospel and in the other Gospels, Mark's Gospel. You've got this idea that Martha is always kind of like representative of the earthly things, serving. There it is, right? Um, which is good. It's, it's not against, nothing against that. It's kind of like, yeah, you've got a body and it's a good thing. Um, and, and Mary's always concerned with the spiritual things uh, that what we might call the heavenly things. And also good. You have a soul, you know, you need, so you can see yourself here um, as a united whole in these two sisters. But now all of a sudden we've got Lazarus. Look, so Martha's serving. Yep, that's for the body. And, and Mary's going to anoint. Yep, that's, a, that's kind of a spiritual action. We're going to see that. But look at this. Lazarus, sitting at table with Jesus. What is the significance of this? He's in the center. Notice how Martha and Mary and Lazarus is in the middle between them. He is the unity of this. He's, he's right here. He is a unity of body and soul. He's a resurrected man. He is completely new, exactly as God intended. And look what God does with the one he has raised. He f eats with him. He has fellowship with him. Little hint about the heavenly banquet we'll participate in forever. Little hint about the Lord's Supper he's about to institute that will unite us to him here on earth even while we wait for his coming. Yep, look, this is what he does when he raises people from the dead. He reclines and has fellowship with them. And you and I know that because we have been raised spiritually in baptism. And in that baptism and faith, we approach his table and commune with him just as certainly and truly as Lazarus did. And we participate with this family, Martha, Lazarus, and Mary, in exactly the same ways. This is you and me. This is the church. Um, it's the same pattern. Now, 
because there's some really curious things happening. We get the serving. We don't, we don't have any questions about that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. We serve all the time. I understand. Lazarus eating at the table. Jesus, okay. But what's this? <laughs> Mary, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is some strange stuff. Take a look at this. She took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet, oh dear, of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. You are going to be so sick and tired of hair by the time we're done with this. Actually, you're going to learn some new things, things I didn't know before this study. Really incredible stuff about what hair means in the Bible. And the, why, why is this happening? Why is she anointing his feet? Normally, normally it's the head. Do you remember the uh, prophets and the kings of old? They would come along and um, they would anoint the head with oil. They would, they would pour anointing oil all over the head. There's a little handle. And that oil would run down on their beard and it would run down on their hair and it would mark them as uh, one of God's divinely appointed, divinely chosen, equipped ones to do something for him. Now, that's great. You know, it makes sense to anoint the, uh, anoint the head, you know. But the feet? Why? Well, now this is what's interesting. I will, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit just so you can see this. Jesus said at the end of this, and I'll leave her alone. We'll talk about that. But so, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is for his burial, Jesus says. And we're going to bring that back here. This is a spiritual act Mary's doing here, anointing his feet. Um, let's put his feet down there. Why? But why feet? Now, this has entirely to do with the thing we talked about up here. Watch this. Do you remember the very first time that God spoke the gospel to Adam and Eve at creation? He spoke to the serpent and he said, you shall, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, that's right, heel. So, when God spoke the very first promise that all the brokenness in the world, all the sin and the death would be restored and, and fixed, he specifically said that there would be a foot that would come down and crush the head and the rule of the serpent. And of course, Mary is anointing Jesus' feet. Do this for us. Do the heel crushing. Get your heel bruised, but crush that serpent's head. Go die. That's the, the bruising of the heel. But crush the head when you do it. Oh, but it's not just that. This is the crazy part. We said it's about two things, right? Here, look at Exodus and Genesis, both participating. The Passover lamb. Did you know that exactly six days before the Passover, all of the people were gathering their Passover lambs? They were gathering them in order to do what? In order to make sure that they were pure. In order to make sure there were no blemishes on these lambs. Because they had to in order to offer them at, this, at the Passover. And the number one thing they would do was check the place where sheep get injured the most. And where do sheep get injured the most? They were always checking their feet because little nicks, little, little scars would make that little sh sheep ineligible. So they would, what they would do is they would put oil on the feet of the sheep to, to make sure that they're protected and they're ready for the Passover. Look at this. Jesus is getting his feet anointed with oil because he is going to do the thing that was promised in crushing the devil. And he is going to do it in the very way of the Passover. You can't make this up. This is God's holy plan. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John said. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. This is a fulfillment of Genesis, Exodus, yes, all the scriptures.
This is Jesus. This is the one. He's going to do it. Now, this ointment, this ointment is made with pure nard. Um, this, is, this has been told to us because it's significant. At the time, this would have been viewed, especially a pound, look at this, a pound of pure nard. This would have been viewed as extraordinarily wasteful. How could you do this? Unless, of course, something is very worthy. Is this lamb worthy? Is this lamb of God worthy of a pound of pure nard? We can only imagine. You know what it says there in, in the book of Revelation. Um, let's write it up here. Worthy is the lamb whose death makes me his own. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Right? This is what the big triumphant heavenly song is even right now. We sing it. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Worthy are you. You're the only one who's worth anything. And yet you put your worthiness on us. Take away our sin. Make us whole. Do your act. That's what you've been sent to do. And so this is exactly what's shown here, even in, in the, the type of ointment and, and the purity of that ointment. Uh, to give you some contrast here, look at this. Um, and you're going to see this. Actually, you know what? Remember this. Hold that. Well, I'm going to put the pause button on that one right there. There. That's what the pause button looks like, right? We'll push pause because I'm going to show you that with, with uh, Judas down below. Wait, wait on this one and the wastefulness that he contests about this. But first, oh, what you really came for. Oh dear, Mary's hair. Why is she wiping with her hair? I mean, it'd be, okay, just use, the, you know, you and I might be, just use the vessel. Just pour it on the feet. Why are you using your hair to wipe it? Now, okay, we're gonna talk about what hair is. What is, what is hair? Um, now, I'm not asking you for the scientific explanation of, oh, it's, um, you know, it's protein. No, no, I, that's not what I'm interested in at all. In the Bible. We're talking about in the Bible. What is hair? And there are, t there are essentially three chief things that we are going to need to do. At its basic level, hair is protection. Protects you from the sun. Protects you from, from from the wind, protects you from the cold, right, and so forth. And even um, specifically, we remember this from Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. What does God give them when they're on the way down out of the out of the garden? Garments of skin. You remember this? The first death in all creation is garments of skin. He clothes them in hair. And by the way, this is a very important thing to remember as we, as we go out from the garden. Every single thing, that, every single layer, uh, starting with this layer of skin, whether it's uh, skins, later a house, right? Uh, later a city, you know, and, and you build layer after layer. Now we're into space, you know, we're in rocket ships, so we can go farther and farther away from the center. You see how far out we can get? Wow. That is what technology allows us to do. And the very first technology ever made was, well, by God, with the garments of skin, hair. Hair is the first technology. Um, and you think, that's not technology. Well, not the way that you and I think of it. But in the Bible, what allows you to move away safely and not get destroyed from the center, um, layer by layer, is start, all starts with hair. Now, um, that's because, back to this, hair, protection, but it's also um, glory in the Bible. It comes out of you, but it's not you. It, uh, it's kind of like it's you, but it's not you. You know what I mean? Um, and this is what's incredible about it. Adam, where, where's Adam? Adam, he changed glory into death. He fell. But what does God do? He changes death into glory. Garments of skin. And this is exactly what we're talking about here. Um, he makes a layer of death. Where's the layer of death? Layer of death to protect you from death. See that? A little bit of a layer of death. Puts a little layer of death around you so he protects you from death. 
in all of its dangerous forms everywhere out in the world. Well, I mean, this is just getting us ready for Jesus. This, this sacrifice, this death of this um, animal, that skin, this hair that covers them, is just getting us ready for the death of Christ and being clothed in his death to protect us cosmically and get us back to him. That's all this is getting us ready for. In fact, the uh, church father, Gregory of Nyssa, said hair is a symbol of death. It has no feeling. Think about hair. Where, where's, where's our hair? Here's our hair. Hair has no feeling. It's got no nerves. It's like a dead version of you. It's what people see, though. What's interesting, isn't it? Like your clothing or your hair. It's, it comes out of you, but it's not alive anymore. It's this glory that covers you. And so this is the second thing that the Bible teaches us about hair. Now, we've got a whole bunch of things. I can't possibly get all the different verses. I'll just... Um, I'll just uh, kind of tell you some of them. From Proverbs 16.31, we, uh, we get this description that as you approach death, you're approaching glory. And we know this because you get white hair. <laughs> Your hair turns white as you approach glory. Now, this, this isn't just a joke. This is, this is absolutely, it makes full sense. Um, white hair coming out of your head. I mean, let's, let's think about that. If the hair was white, this is like light, like coming out of your head, right? You think about, um, uh, look, check that out in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 31 or 1631. I should actually, where's, where's my Bible? I'll, let me open that up for us. So you can see that. Hopefully you can see it from where you are there. Where's Proverbs 16 verse one, no 16 verse 31. Here it is there. Can you see that? I don't know. I don't know that you can see that. Let's see. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Wow. White hair and glory connected. Um, uh, how about another one? Leviticus 19.32. Let me go there for us. This is kind of some neat stuff when you really realize uh, what hair means in the Bible. And yes, don't worry. All of this is going to come back and uh, be connected. Look at this here. You shall stand up before the gray head and uh, it says, and honor the face of an old man and you shall fear your God. What? Honor gray hair and fear God? That's because, guess what? Gray hair, white hair means you're approaching glory. You're approaching death. God has made death into glory. He has covered us in a little bit of death to protect us from the ultimate death. This is what God does from the beginning to his son, Jesus, who is the ultimate fulfillment of it. I mean, think about it. What, what color is the hair of the son of man, say, in, in the book of Daniel or in the book of Revelation? What color is his hair? It's white. <laughs> it's completely white. And that white hair is a description of the glory of having changed death into glory for us and covering us. Um, now, I think that's probably enough on hair. I, I mean, there is, I could keep going. You don't want me to uh, keep going on, on the glory idea uh, because it just goes and goes and goes all through um, the scriptures. But I want, there's one more thing that hair means. So it means protection. It means glory, but it also means power or strength. And you're thinking, what? How is, how is that true? Um, I'm just going to block that off so you can see this here. Power and strength. It, is, it, is a, it, is a, it means your ability to act on the world. And you're thinking, why does hair mean that? Well, we said earlier... It's the first, it's connected to all these things. The first layer that allows you to go out from the center, you know, then a, later a house, then a city, then a rocket, eventually when you're way, way, way out layer by layer. Hair is the first. And so it is completely uh, a representation of your ability to act. Now, you, this isn't a surprise. When I, the moment I ask the next question, you're going to go, oh, of course it is. What major, here it is, what major Old Testament story do we know about where hair is strength? That's right, Samson. You remember that story? Where Samson 
was this strong man, and he, this is my best efforts of drawing a strong man, he was, he was, he was, we were told that he was strong because he had this big head of hair, and he was, this, and the secret about him was that his hair was his strength, and if they could only cut off his hair, then they, he would lose his strength. Do you remember this story? Unbelievable story, because it shows exactly what we're talking about. And of course, at the end, they did, they did cut his hair off, and he lost all his strength, and so they were able to bind him. But then, for one last effort, when he had everybody there, all the enemies of God gathered in one place, he sacrificed himself, he said, God, just give me one more bit of strength. Boom. And he was a picture of Jesus sacrificing his life to destroy the enemies of God. Those, uh, all those things that are after us are sin and death. So, but he was this, it was the hair that gave him the strength. And we know another story, perhaps. Um, so hair means power. It means strength and an ability to act on the world. Um, outwardly, outward act. Um, now, th th you probably also know a story about Absalom and his outer strength. We're told in, uh, in the story of Absalom that Absalom's hair was so heavy that um, he had to cut it once a year and, and would weigh it. Like, by the way, he's the only person in all the Bible you're told about the weight of his hair. And um, the weight of his hair was, med they, they even tell you like how heavy, how heavy it actually was. And this is like a hysterical idea. Why would you be telling us about the weight of this guy's hair? Well, because it was absolutely a description of his power. He was going up against King David. And in fact, if you know the end of the story, the sad ending of this story is that he rebels. He does not listen to authority, but thinks that he, because he has power, he, um, he does, he has all the hair, he has all the power and he does not need to listen to David. Um, David wants to save him, but in the end, you know, that fateful ending for, for Absalom, his hair, as he was trying to flee when his, his army um, lost. His hair was caught. He was riding on a donkey and it got caught on, um, in the tree so that his, his, all his hair ended up being his undoing. He thought that his power and his ability to act on the world was enough to, to overthrow the authority that God had established and he was found um, to be completely unable. His donkey ran off and he got caught by the hair up in the tree and then when Joab and the other um, army men found him they speared him in the side now you know that story there's Jesus again hanging from a tree crowned in thorns speared in the side to make sure he's dead that's the story of Absalom David's son well, yes, David's son and David's Lord, Jesus, is the one who fulfills that story. Same with the Samson story. It's, the, it's Jesus. You're getting ready. But for our purposes today, know at least that you can see from Samson to Absalom, power and, and hair are essentially the same thing. Um, so let's think about this. Look at these three things we have here. Um, all things are, you know, you know these verses in, Bi in the Bible, like, not a hair, remember in the, in, the, in the fiery furnace, not a hair on the head shall be singed. Or every, God has counted every single hair um, on your head. What, it's not just talking about his knowledge of everything. He knows your ability to act on the world. He understands the glory he's going to reveal in you. He knows how to protect you. So all of creation, all things are measured and accounted for and redeemed in Christ. And that's what this story today demonstrates. We're going to go back now that we know what hair means. And we're going to ask, why then does Mary use her hair? And by now you've probably come ca captured it. Mary marks Jesus as the one who will change death into glory. 
she wipes her death, her hair, on his feet with the oil that marks him for death and burial. In him all creation will be accounted for. God goes to redeem his creation. And the Hebrew person would have seen this act of hair and oil and would have known she is marking him as lamb, as, as new, as heel being bruised, so to say, being buried, the one who's equipped to do this. What a moment. Now, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Why does John tell us this? Why does he need to tell us that the house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume that has anointed this one? Well, think about it. What other um, instances in scripture do we hear of a house being filled? There's kind of two that come to my mind. The one is in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord and the whole house is filled with smoke, right? He has a vision and he thinks, oh, oh, I'm a dead man. And then, nope. Um, that is, of course, the glory uh, of the Lord that, that fills the house, fills the whole house. And then, of course, the other one would be Pentecost, uh, Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills the whole house. So we have this absolutely clear picture that what's happening here is that the glory and the Holy Spirit are filling. It's not just for Jesus. Everyone in the house, the entire, um, the entire space, all of creation is being fragranced and perfumed by this. It's, it's going to be for more than Jesus. The Spirit and the glory of God are showing themselves to be active here. Now, we also know this because of this big butt. The big butt of scripture, they say, right? So the moment that the spirit and glory of God manifest in the house, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was the ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Notice who is immediately bothered by the glory and the spirit of God. It's Judas. Who does Judas care about? Well, not because he cared about the poor. Nope. He cares about himself. He has a hidden motive. Oh, but it looks so pious. Look at him caring for the poor. Now, this is interesting, too. I mentioned before, I, I put the pause button up here. We're going to undo that now. The Torah spoke against wastefulness. And at the time, a couple of drops of this kind of nard was to be used in water to wash the feet of guests. Two, by the way, two drops if it was a very important guest, and only one drop if it was maybe a regular guest. But a pound an entire pound without any water, just anointing the feet. Oh, this is wasteful. And so Judas, he pulls up this attempt to look righteous and pious and listening to the Torah. And he says this, but his motive is completely hidden. He doesn't care about the poor. He cares about himself. And here we have that whole fig leaf hide and reveal thing. He's hidden his motive and he's revealing something else. Jesus, however, is being revealed in this anointing. He doesn't want the Lamb of God revealed to be the Lamb of God for the world. No. He would be practical. You could use that for yourself. And this, brothers and sisters, is where we need to watch our hearts. My heart, your heart, has a hidden motive when it wants things. Old Adam grumbles when God uses you to give yourself to someone. He asks What's in it for him? He fights the spirit's work. Just like Judas, the moment the fragrance hits the house, Judas is, ah, he's triggered. Strike him down dead. To put the old Adam to death with Christ. Ask God to reveal his ways in you. 
to those around you and bring glory to his name. Don't let the Judas, the old Adam, try and act like he's all pious and righteous when he's really being greedy. And this is what we can see here. Having charge of the money, he used to help himself to whatever was there. Look at the greed. Mary, generous. Judas, greedy. And Jesus, the most generous, going with his whole life for you and me, regardless of whether we deserve it or not. But it, it, oh, what's incredible is what's trying to be revealed is that Judas is the most generous. He's the one concerned about the poor. Nope. Things are opposite. Things are hidden and revealed here at the fig, at the house of figs. You watch. This house is showing you something spectacular. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. She's going to use it later. You remember this? Remember how she came to the tomb? There's more. Now, for the poor, you always have with you but you do not always have me, the lamb. It's appropriate. It's worth pointing out because all the poor will be saved by this one lamb. All the poor need this righteousness. All the poor, you and me, need a new creation. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, that is in Bethany, they came not only on account of him, Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Jesus had raised. So the priest, chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So we saw this, first of all, this large crowd. We saw this in John 6. This is the only other time we've heard about the large crowd. This is, of course, the Exodus connection, the picture of that Passover right? Where uh, a large crowd is led out of Egypt to the mountain of God. Well, there's a large crowd gathering around Jesus and he is leading them to Jerusalem. Wait, this is the Exodus in a couple verses, but it's also Genesis from the house of figs up to the tree of the curse and the tree of life, which Jesus in his cross on the mountain has made into one tree. That's right. Now, I love this part too. I didn't mention this before. Lazarus. It means the one God has helped. Why does the crowd want to see Lazarus? The one that God has helped? Because, well, he was dead and he's alive. That's what that means. So what can we expect from the world when we've been helped by God? First of all, they might want to see, but the chief priest made plans to put him to death as well. We can expect persecution. What is encouraging though, think about this, about the way God uses the one he has helped by God. How is he using you? Is that when on account of the one, this Lazarus, who has been helped, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Dear one, God is using the way you are persecuted for the faith to bring people to faith in Jesus. People are believing in Jesus because God has helped you. You are the one God has helped. He has baptized you. He has preached to you. You have been forgiven and you know it and you have faith. And guess what? Not only has he done that, he's using you for others so that they too will believe. So don't spurn the persecution. Accept it if God sends it because he's making faith in other people through you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you created all things new. You are the Passover lamb, our Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and everything points to that, that we might know 
how you have made death into glory for us. You have covered us in your death. You have made it so that now we know the entire story. Thank you for that and use us. We are the ones you've helped. Use us to show your glory that others might believe as you did with Lazarus. Use us also and have us accept plots and schemes to persecute us with joy, knowing that this is how you bring your gospel and kingdom out into the world. Strengthen our faith for this end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Wow. I hope you're ready to go up because the next account is the entry into Jerusalem, triumphal entry of Jesus on the donkey. Let's, let's meet back for that next week. Bye for now.